Sometimes nature is obvious in its design, and other times, not so much. Patterns cover this entire planet, and while they may seem like random designs, they can actually reveal quite a lot. Based on the work of famous mathematician Alan Turing, scientists have created the emerging field of mathematical biology. And in this next film, we see how scientists are using this technique to unveil the hidden realm of patterns, with the ultimate goal of harnessing them to save species across the world. Make sure you stick around after the credits for a short Q&A with the filmmakers. And now from producer Christina Chioka, this is A Natural Code. We live in a universe of patterns. Every night, stars move across the sky. No two snowflakes are ever the same. Intricate waves move across the oceans. The wind creates ripples in sand. Nature's love for patterns extends into the animal kingdom with a multitude of designs. All of these patterns seem disconnected. But what if they weren't? My name is Natasha Allison. This is a story about how we can use maths to understand more about nature, to try and help endangered species throughout the world. People have never really thought, how did the animal get its coat markings? Why does this animal have one coat? Why does it have another coat? Can we understand that? There was one person who wrote a theory that gave us a whole new way of seeing nature. He was able to see that seemingly different patterns might not be that different at all. His name was Alan Choring. Alan Turing may be best known for decrypting German messages in World War II. Not only did he save many lives and create one of the first computers, he helped us understand patterns in nature. And it was his thinking about mathematics in this kind of way that was behind the first kinds of mathematical biology research. The whole area of mathematical biology is about understanding nature more using mathematics. Alan Turing wrote that patterns in nature can form due to the reaction and spread of two chemicals. These chemicals are called an activator and an inhibitor. The activator encourages production of itself, whilst the inhibitor slows the production of the activator. Turing wrote some special mathematical conditions for this process to produce patterns, such as spots and stripes. We could explain this using an analogy of fires and firefighters. If we imagine a really dry forest, so dry that fires are likely to randomly break out, we could prevent this by spreading firefighters across the forest, waiting for the fires to appear. We can think of the firefighters as the inhibitor chemical, stopping the activating fires from producing more of themselves and spreading out too far. As we predicted, fires break out. And if the firefighters spread much faster than the fires, they are able to stop the production and the spread of the fires, which leaves burnt patches or spots across the forest. That's how choring patterns are created. One of the things that this theory of Turing, I think, tells us is about Turing himself, um, because it shows just what a far-reaching and inquiring and inventive mind he had. And the sad thing is, he, he did this work, he published this work in 1952, and he died in 1954, tragically. Had he lived, where would we now be in terms of our understanding of biology? 
but we can learn so much more from him. Researchers have used Choring's theory to describe how many things in the world get their pattern. We can see Choring patterns everywhere. From a zebra's stripes, to a cheetah's spots, to the goosebumps on our skin. It's also been used to understand more about how animals use their space. For example, in my research, I study how birds move and why they live in the ranges and the territories that they live in. And instead of chemicals, we look at the location of the animal. And the things that, that drive this, instead of chemicals reacting together, are animal behaviours, such as an animal moving away from scent marks or moving towards its den, or maybe moving towards prey. If we understand why animals move in a certain way, maybe we can understand how best to protect them when humans are changing their habitat so much. Could we use Choring's theory to try and help endangered species throughout the world? When you have an encounter with a shark, if you look at it from the top, you just look at it and it seems like stars moving through the water, just gliding so effortlessly and it's it's like looking at a constellation and it's just really beautiful. The patterns of the whale shark are very interesting in that they, these unique patterns form the shark's individual spot pattern and this unique spot pattern can be used to then identify each individual shark. The Whale Shark Research Program is an NGO that works in the Maldives to conserve whale sharks in the area through research and community mobilization. On our daily whale shark surveys, we go out on the reef on the South Area Marine Protected Area. We take identification shots from the left side, the right side and the top of the shark and then we run it through a software called i3s which is linked to the database and it gives us the closest matches to the shark and then we are able to know which shark we saw. Once the research team has a picture of a whale shark, they use the spot pattern from the picture to decide which individual it is and they use a mathematical algorithm developed by NASA to decide the individual based on the distance between all the spots. So just by looking at these spots and patterns, we can then recognize a whole lot more about each and individual shark. Collecting information about each individual whale shark can help with understanding the movements of the shark, the geographical range of the shark, even information about the lifespan of the shark and help create protected areas for these endangered, elusive creatures. One example would be in helping us create marine protected areas for the whale sharks. The South Area Marine Protected Area has been created with the use of data collected, mostly through photo identification. We can use this data that the team collected to be able to write a mathematical model which will help us predict the whale shark's population in the world, which at the moment we don't even have an estimation for. We could find out more about where the whale sharks prefer to swim according to different variables that the team collected, such as temperature, wind speed, or current direction. All of this from being able to identify them using their beautiful pattern. And it's not just the Whale Shark Research Program. Organizations are now running projects with jaguars and zebras to identify individuals using their patterns. Thanks to Choring, patterns in nature are beginning to reveal their secrets. He's shown us how to create patterns we see in nature and we've seen such an interesting way of using them. If identifying individuals using their pattern has already had such a positive effect on the conservation of whale sharks by creating the marine protected area, what else can we do? How much more does Choring's theory have to give? And where else can we use it to understand more about our world?
Now, what inspired this film? Let's talk to the filmmakers. I am Chris Choka. Um, I'm the filmmaker from A Natural Code. I'm Dr. Natasha Ellison, and I'm a mathematical ecologist from the University of Sheffield. Finding the idea for A Natural Code was um, mostly uh, Natasha, because um, this brilliant, brilliant introduction into mathematical ecology has everything to do with Natasha. So. Uh, yeah, I was very lucky to meet Chris. Uh, I've been studying this kind of mathematics for a while now and I always wanted a place to be able to show it to the general public and when I met Chris she was so interested and she had so many ideas about how to make this film, uh, bringing whale sharks into it for example, um, it was all Chris's idea. Uh, so yeah, I got really lucky that, that we were able to make this together and uh, Chris was so creative. So I, it began when I was studying my master's in mathematics and I came across uh, a paper by Alan Turing, which the, the film mentions, um, and, and lots of other scientists have been studying it for years. And, and I think there's something attractive about animal patterns, isn't there? Leopards and zebras and things that really, really makes us want to know more about them. And, and because I was a mathematician and there was mathematics behind this, it was just so interesting. I know it's, even if it's a 10 minute um, documentary, it involved a lot of people collaborating uh, to be able to tell the story. So we collaborated with a visual artist as well for the patterns that were created. They are actually Turing patterns that you can see on the screen for the visuals. We also included uh, some of the underwater footage that we filmed in the Maldives with the whale sharks. They were done in collaboration with uh, the Maldives Whale Shark Research Program that they are working tirelessly from the boat every day um, with volunteers and with citizen science as well. Uh, they've developed an app that was based um, similar to the NASA algorithm to identify the stars. Uh, to identify individual whale sharks. So uh, that was an amazing collaboration that we were able to do because it was in a way um, showing how science communication can and science can, can help um, endangered species around the world. Something I'm working on now is, is a project at primary schools. So that's ages aged like nine to 10, um, where we're, we're trying to sort of show them about choring patterns in the hope that you know when they get into the high school and when they go on to study if they do that they'd be interested in doing maths and then you know we can push that sort of research area forward so i guess that's one of the most important things of the film is inspiring younger people into these kind of areas for me um, i have another wildlife film um, project coming up so it'll be a um, shorter a, a longer version of It'll be about 20 to 30 minutes, and it'll be about um, like Transylvania's forests. It'll be about um, deforestation and habitat loss, um, and also plans to like recover from that. So how are uh, young people involved into reforestation projects in Transylvania? That's, that's the new project coming up. As a, a scientist, who you know has I have limited um, filmmaking experience or anything nothing uh, well I've not made a film before myself but finding people like Chris to um, promote your research and be able to creatively show people um, your ideas of science is really important you know I could have sat down for months and months and learnt it myself but that's that's not helpful it's helpful to to go and seek out filmmakers and seek out people that you're going to be able to work with. Um, and as Chris mentioned in a previous answer, to collaborate with people, these collaborations are really important. If there's like any advice for upcoming science communicators or filmmakers, is I think remember why you're doing it. So every time you think maybe you, you've lost your way or you don't know how to do it or how to say it better or why is it even worth it or everything is just remember why you've started it and why, what's your passion for it because that's I think your biggest tool into science communication is like people are going to see your passion for the subject and they want to they want to they they will want to learn more just because they will see that drive and passion in in your eyes so just 
always go back to your inner self when you when you don't know where which way to go. Doesn't this just make you want to get outside and discover patterns in the nature around you? Thanks for watching Secret Indies premiere of A Natural Code. It's stories like these that can inspire more discoveries, more adventures, and new ideas that may one day help save our planet.